Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. With the country in the throes still of a major rethink on everything from the way police function in our communities to the way prosecutors put people in jail and to the way prisons function and do they really do what we all imagine they're supposed to be doing. While all that is going on and increasing calls for reorienting priorities and policing, even defunding the police altogether, as has come up in some communities. Against that backdrop, the conversation we present today with my guest, Aya Gruber, who is a professor of law at the University of Colorado and the author of a new book that takes a somewhat different but very closely related take on these questions. Her book is called The Feminist War on Crime. She is a lifelong feminist, former public defender, and now scholar and writer on these topics. And she really asks the question uh, whether it is an act of consistent with feminist thinking to put gender crime perpetrators in prison at a time when we have such deep concerns about the police, prosecution, and imprisonment system, the entire criminal justice system we have in this country. It is a conversation where we're dealing with a lot of tension and conflict and history involving these very important issues. And I does a great job, both in the book, which I enjoyed reading, and in our conversation today, a very important perspective from a a feminist scholar on the criminal justice system, Aya Gruber, whose book is The Feminist War on Crime. Great conversation. Stay tuned. Enjoy. Everybody, please stay safe and well and good. Stay tuned. On today's episode, we're talking about the intersection of feminism and uh, what we need to do to fix the criminal justice system. My guest, uh, I want to welcome her on good, welcome her to Good Law, Bad Law, is Aya Gruber. Uh, Aya, first of all, thank you so much for being on the podcast to talk about this really fascinating and important topic. Well, thank you so much for having me. Now, I, I, I know that um, just looking over some of your background uh, that you teach at the University of Colorado uh, in the law school there, uh, and previously you taught at the University of Iowa's law school, uh, graduate of Berkeley uh, in the Bay Area, which is my hometown, and Harvard Law School, uh, and spent some time as a public defender in Washington, which I gather from reading the book is where you really started to experience some of the tension between uh, feminism and feminist thinking about criminal justice and the actual day-to-day workings and experiences of the criminal justice system. Um, I thought maybe you could start, Aya, by give us some, maybe that's the launching point uh, or, or something else is to help us understand the, the big picture of what you're trying to accomplish in the book and how this is something that uh, you came to write. Yeah, it's really interesting because I had been thinking about the tension between feminism and sort of my desire to be a public defender, uh, my civil libertarian side, even before I was in law, uh, in law school, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I, I grew up, being a feminist, I considered myself, you know, very pro-women's rights. I believed that there was a patriarchy. Um, and at the same time, from a very young age, I had a deep skepticism of the state's ability to sort of put people in cages. My mm-hmm. mother, um, she had been interned during World War II. Um, so, like, she had directly experienced, you know, being detained for her race. And 
we, you you're know, talking about you're young, talking about the you're talking about the Japanese American internment camps during World War yeah, II. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. The Japanese yeah. American internment camps. So you know, I, I had sort of grown up with this skepticism of you know carcerality, basically putting people mm -hmm. in prison. And I started interning as a public defender when I was 15, and you know, I met a um, one of the clients of the lawyer I was interning for was a 15 year old girl. Um, charged as an accessory to a murder that her boyfriend had committed, and so you know, the, you know, these things were swirling around in my head when I was in law school. I was a feminist. I wanted to become a public defender. I, I knew that I wanted to sort of be on the side that protected people's civil civil liberties and really held the government um, to a very high standard when it wanted to put somebody in jail. But at the same time, because of my feminist side, I, you know, had always, you know, there had been a, a message that was always in the ether that gender crimes like domestic violence and rape were just the worst of the worst and the sites of women's oppression. So I really wanted to be a public defender, but at the same time, I was totally dreading the prospect of representing batterers and rapists. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah, like so much so that the thought of, you know, defending a batterer in a misdemeanor case actually caused me more mental stress than the thought of defending somebody accused of murder. This yeah. is how sort of in that feminist mindset I was. Mm -hmm. Well, so and then that, when that was kind of my dilemma. Well, and then you go into academia, and this is something that then occupies a lot of your time and attention in your research. And I know, again, just from looking at your bio and, and reading the book, you've, you've written about the law and rape, you've written about domestic violence reform, other topics that would fall under the, you know, broad headline, the broad heading of gendered crimes, as you say. Um, and, but all this seems to have been swirling around still in your thinking that leads you to write the book that that has just come out, uh, the feminist war on crime, and I mean this is this is obviously a very timely topic now because of everything that we're that the country is talking about and protesting about and becoming more aware of and more conscious of and more educated about, hopefully, uh, and and indeed all over the world, not just in our country, in the aftermath of the killing of, of George Floyd. Uh, ideas of mass incarceration, criminal justice inequality, the intersection of racism and the criminal justice system. But people haven't really, at least not yet, as part of that broader conversation, been talking about the intersection between uh, and, and perhaps even some of the conflicts between feminism and uh, criminal justice reform. So, I mean, walk us through some of the thinking that led to wanting to explore that tension and that conflict in, in this book that you've now come out with. Yeah, so just a, um, an interesting little tidbit. So when I was a student, and this was back in the late 90s, I actually wrote an article about this, what I called feminist defense attorney dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. And I characterize it as this dilemma, like I want, I, you know, I'm anti-mass incarceration, I'm anti-police policing or police brutality, I should say. Um, but, you know, I am also anti-violence against women. What do I do? And that actually student article got picked up in um, a leading casebook, Dressler's Criminal Law Casebook. Hmm. And to this day, it's now 20 years later, right, more than 20 years later. And, I, you know, I still get questions. Well, what about that dilemma? What about that dilemma? And in fact, for me, that dilemma had pretty much resolved itself when I went to practice as a public defender, um, because I was doing a lot of practicing in these specialized domestic violence courts um, that were a product of feminist activism and reform. And so the special features of the domestic violence program included like requiring police to arrest when there was a domestic violence call, so no, no discretion, requiring mm -hmm. prosecutors not to drop cases, specially training the judges, and just making it a lot easier to prosecute these cases. And, 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 and to was, be very yeah. much tough on the on the perpetrators. I mean, some of the very things, much a, right. a, a tough on DV, right. you know, 
you know, whether the woman realizes it or not, we need to separate the couple, you know, um, you know, we got to take domestic violence seriously, no matter what either of them say. So then what I was seeing was like this revolving door of incarceration for, you know, very marginalized, often people of color. Mm -hmm. And it didn't seem to be helping them. I would get victims sort of, you know, begging me, the defense attorney, you know, I wanted the police to intervene, but I didn't want him locked up. And can you get the judge to lift the stay away order? Well, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know, I saw immigrant women uh, lamenting that their call to the police for help triggered this penal machine that made their spouses deportable, Mm -hmm. right? So I saw a lot of these dysfunctions and I realized that this automatic idea that I had in my head that we would achieve justice through prosecution, right? Like the answer to the problem of gender violence was prosecution. I never really questioned it, right? Like, it, of course, and that's why I had the dilemma. I realized that maybe this isn't such a dilemma because pros- prosecution doesn't seem to be working out very well for anybody, for the women, for the men, for people of color, for poor people. I mean, I saw couples lose eligibility for public housing because he had the domestic violence conviction. Mm-hmm. So, it, so the whole thing struck me as maybe this, you know, approach isn't so great. So I started as a professor writing about, um, you know, these current facets of feminist criminal law reform and how maybe they're not working out so great, these pro-prosecution, high sentences, arrest everybody mode, and maybe they didn't, you know, distribute the consequences in a way that feminists would like because it was a lot of poor people of color who were getting, um, you know, into this system that was so tough and unforgiving. And, you know, both the women and the men were often complaining about it. And in fact, with domestic violence, once they went to mandatory arrest, a lot of these jurisdictions, studies of them showed that they increased arrests of men for domestic violence, but they exponentially multiplied arrests of women um, because basically you were telling the police, go arrest everybody. Mm. So once I realized this, I started talking about some of the, the potential pitfalls of feminist law reform um, from the perspective of criminal justice, you know, anti-mass incarceration and, and racial justice perspective. But, and, and so I did that for many years, right? Um, you know, as, as a law professor for, for over a decade, I wrote on like, well, you know, he, here's the thought of how this criminal law is going to work. Here's the reality of how this criminal law is going to work. And it, it, it's not so good. It's not necessarily stopping violence. It might even be escalating violence as policing often does. Well, so then, you know, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. No, I was just going to say quickly, then when I came up for the idea for this book, I was just going to kind of put all my law review articles together and say, okay, I've got a law review article <laughs> on rape, on domestic violence. But then, you know, as I started writing the book, you know, I realized, wait, I understand that for the past 20 years, 30 years, feminists have championed a lot of these pro-prosecution policies and laws, but how, how did this come about? Like, how, how did this sort of feminist folk knowledge that I had had, right, like that, that we should just be going for more and more policing, like, where did that come from? So instead of just throwing all of my articles together, I really started to dig in to the origins of, of how I, as a law student, ended up in this dilemma. And that's where, I, that's where the book sort of flowed into sort of an accounting of the feminist commitment to criminal law over the last hundred years. Well, yeah. And that, so, so that's what's, that's what I find so fascinating and, and still hard to unravel because the, what the feminist dilemma that you encountered that you wrote about when you became a public defender, how does somebody, how does a feminist defend and represent in a legal proceeding, uh, a domestic violence perpetrator or someone who's, you know, alleged to committed a rape or a sexual assault. Um, but you've got these two, uh, tr- you know, trend lines as the law evolves through 
through history to bring us to where we are today, uh, 20 years since your, or 20 years or so since you encounter, first encountered that, that feminist dilemma, where that conflict and tension feels even sharper, more sharply in focus. You know, the, the trend line of, uh, of the way women are treated in the law, um, and it's not a very good track record in, in the history of our country, um, to the point where you now have the Me Too, Me Too movement. We were alluding to this, you and I, a little bit before we started. I mean, a generation ago, it would have been inconceivable for a Harvey Weinstein to be actually convicted in, in, in a jury trial. And we've now seen that uh, a few months ago, and and I'm and many feminists, I'm, I know I'm sure we're cheering that as and as it should be cheered. Um, and yet you also have this trend line which you talk about, which is a more pro a development of a progressive understanding of you know what you're calling or we call mass incarceration, but it's a lot more than just a lot of people or too many people being in jail, right? It's also all of the consequences of that throughout the legal system and the social and economic impact of that. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, when we talk about the, you know, everybody's talking about defund the police and the cost of policing, and, and it's not actually policing. It's policing, prosecution, and imprisonment. Yeah. And it's not even just that, right? It's the prison industrial sort of complex and the um, collateral consequences and the um, decimation of entire communities due to people being incarcerated. So, you know, well, can you give an example of that? Yeah, can ahead. you give an example of that, I? Because that I think a lot of people are starting to hear this kind of view expressed. I mean, you watch the protests and people are, you know, defund and mass incarcerated. You know, we're hearing a lot of the, that language, but I, I mean, I. I think it would be so helpful to because you've you've lived it and you were a defender and you've thought this all through. I mean, can you give us some examples or an example that illustrates just how deep and broad those impacts are felt from uh, from the from the system that we have today, as you put it, police, police prosecution and and imprisonment. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, it it just it goes. So far back, I mean, people have heard of the cradle to prison pipeline for poor black men, especially, but poor black children. Um, you know, the fact that encounters with police data have shown that encounters with police create lifelong morbid stress. Um, that, that's a real public health problem. Mm. When you have a segment of your community that is in and out of jail and dealing with the traumas of jail and the traumas of going to jail and being released from jail. Uh, they have trouble uh, adjusting in social ways. Um, they are unable to get jobs because of the co collateral consequences, right? They are economically marginalized. So when you have a big subset of your community that has both, you know, trauma, um, you know, lack of opportunity and lack of resources, that's a terrible thing for communities. And all it does is drive the dysfunction even further in the community and drive up front, right? So there are all these collateral consequences to policing, prosecution, and punishment. I mean, another one that a lot of people sort of on the, on the right side of the spectrum realizes is also really expensive. Mm -hmm. It's an expensive way to deal with harm and social problems. It's not entirely an effective way. I mean, you have some studies that say, okay, some hotspot policing here is, is working, some there isn't. But if you look at the natural experiment of New York City, where after de Blasio took office mm -hmm. and directed the police not to engage in stop and frisk, stop and frisks over two years precipitously declined. And when I say precipitous, I mean by 98%, yeah. right? So they were doing racialized of it, and those just stopped. And guess what? Crime actually also decreased. When the police in 2014 and 15 in New York City kind of went on their police strike, right? They, they don't actually have striking powers, but they just decided they were no longer going to, you know, issue tickets and do stops and do arrests. Um, so they kind of went on that little bit of a strike for that period because they were mad at de Blasio. Um, social scientists have studied that period. And actually, they found 
no correlation between crime rates and that depolicing move. In other words, crime crime rates remained relatively flat. They decreased a little bit. Um, but basically, we have all this massive policing prosecution and imprisoning people. And I would be very comfortable saying there's at least as much evidence that that whole um, process causes more crime than, than decreases crime. And so we have all of that going on. And at the same time, there are huge human and racial costs to this system we've relied so heavily on. Right. So, you know, I don't blame people for, you know, relying heavily on it. In my book, I get into all the politics and, you know, sociocultural mindset behind the war on crime. So it's a lot more in depth there. But just to put it bluntly, when you see a crime, when you see an individual harming another individual, it's natural to say, oh, my God, you know, I, 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 I want to punish that person. That, that's justice, right? I mean, that's just how, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people think that way, but that's the way people think, right? It's, it's much easier to see things in sort of the, the, the fast-moving sense of retribution than to take a step back and look at all the moving parts that caused this person to harm another person and, you know, sort of the complex ways over time that we can prevent these kind of harms. It's just easier to say, you know, you know, as a person who's not in the system, it's easier to say, okay, just throw them in jail. But I think it's becoming pretty obvious, especially through these protests, that that is not an easy thing at all. Right, that that is sort of one part of an entire process that has proven over time to be extremely harmful in many ways. Well, and what I what I like about what you how you approach this in, in the book is it again, and I I think it's helpful and 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 instructive to talk about these issues in these kind of concrete ways that we now are, and in specific ways, what you do is say. Okay, here's where we are. Let's go back and understand how we got here. So, you know, it's one thing to say the criminal justice system is racist. It's another to really understand how that can be when you look back and see for how long in our history, uh, you know, the criminal law has been applied so inequitably and and with a racial uh and, and through a racial lens in so many instances, uh, that just that just makes your argument so much more compelling if you can if you can call upon that history and understand that. And that's also what you do, of course, in looking at the the evolution of the law in terms of women and, and, and the way women have been treated, because you you bring us all up to the present as well, where we're kind of almost in, enjoying a, uh, you know, a. A, a golden age, in a sense, in terms of attitudes towards gendered crime and the perpetrators of uh, of, of those gendered crimes: sexual assault, rape, domestic violence. I mean, Harvey Weinstein is, you know, is 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 going to prison for a long time. Um, so, may, bring us back to to this tension, then. I mean. It's one thing when you're wrestling with these as a as a young public defender. Um, how do we rationalize on the one hand wanting to see perpetrators of sexual assault, of rape, of sex, sexual crimes locked up? I mean, these are people, if we're going to create a spectrum of, you know, not so serious to very serious crimes, those would be people who we probably most of us would agree belong on this the more serious crimes end of the spectrum how do you rationalize as a feminist wanting to see those people punished with attitudes and views that you've developed that uh you, you know that are that are that join with and are, and are aligned with those who are seeing racial uh impact in their criminal justice system and you don't want to see the the prisons crowded with people. You don't want to see the the police have such enormous power. You don't want to see uh, 
the prosecution have all the weapons and power that they have? How do you rationalize those two paths? Well, you can't have it both ways, right? So you might look at Harvey Weinstein as the ideal criminal, right? Like he puts a face on why incarceration and the entire carceral system and prison industrial complex is justified. You have a picture of Harvey Weinstein in your mind, and he's the good. Um, he's the poster right? boy. <laughs> right. right. He's the poster child, right? Right, right. Um, but, but that's always been the case. And just pick your poster child. It was once Willie Horton, right, in, yeah. a, in a very racialized way. Yeah. Every, a, anybody can pick out any other person who does harm, and, and especially somebody who, you know, society agrees is the worst of the worst. Say, okay, here's this one person, you know, look. That person is just really evil, you know, is a serial killer, really terrible person. Mm -hmm. Therefore, right, therefore this system is justified. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that that attitude, right, that sort of monstrous offender, you know, focusing on ideal victims also, right, and ideal victims have always been portrayed as sort of vulnerable white children and women, you know, focusing on ideal criminals and ideal victims you know, has been the discourse that has created this monster that we call mass incarceration. Because the fact of the matter is that most of the people who encounter these heavily armed, militarized police are misdemeaning, including people who commit domestic violence. Most mm. of those cases are misdemeanor cases. Yeah. They are low-level offenses. Right. And most of the people that come within the purview of this system aren't rich like Harvey Weinstein. They're the poorest among us, right? They're people who have, uh, you know, just a lot in their history and background that leads them to have the type of social and emotional stressors that lead to violent or bad behavior. A lot of these people are people of color. So if you are against racialized mass incarceration, but then, you know, you continuously say, but look at this random, like, one really bad poster child for everything I, I don't like, and I want him in jail. You know, you're, you're engaging in sort of conflicting discourses. Yeah. Um, because using those spectacular cases where everybody agrees this guy should go to jail as a justification for a system that largely affects people that are nothing like that guy um, is just irresponsible. And I think for too long, feminists have assumed, okay, when we talk about rape and DV, when we talk about sexual violence and DV, we're talking about these guys that are just like nobody would agree that they're serial rapists and they're killers and they're, you know, horrible and they're going to kill somebody. In fact, that was the discourse. If you let anybody um, go, right, who's committed domestic abuse or even coercion or anything domestically, if, if you don't lock them up for a really long time, um, which, by the way, you can't lock up a misdemeanor for a really long time. You know, you can only lock them up for a year or two. Um, but if you don't lock them up, right, if you don't use the policing system against somebody who's committed abuse, the woman will end up dead, right? Like, so again, going from, you know, one mile an hour to a thousand, right? Like, so the woman will end up dead. Which plays well, on when, people's fears. And right. I, I mean, I think oftentimes that's exactly the intent, right? I mean, the whole Willie Horton thing well, was designed to play on on white fears of violent uh, you know, well violent absolutely if you spectacularize black. crime right if you spectacularize criminals if you have a bunch of movies and tv shows yeah. that pit good cops right good militarized cops against bad sort of either sexually deviant or or, or brown and black gang member criminals right if you pit the good cops against the, the bad criminals, then we totally only see our fellow citizens as the source of violence. And we cannot see the official state violence that is going on. But, but now people are seeing it. But just quickly on the DV, when a, a researcher got around to studying whether these mandatory domestic violence arrest policies actually increase or decrease domestic homicides. And, and let me say, domestic homicides are, are fairly rare occurrences. And, um, you know, 
violence within the family is a, a far more frequent occurrence. So, you know, you know, saying one leads to the other, even statistically wouldn't be true because there are just so few uh, domestic homicides that it wouldn't be that highly correlative. But this researcher looked at um, the domestic homicides before and after the advent of mandatory arrest policies and found that having a mandatory arrest policy actually statistically significantly increased the chances of a domestic homicide. And she hypothesized mm. that she hypothesized that the reason why is, you know, if, if there is a person in that's being serially abused by a partner, um, they might call the police. And if it ends up in an arrest in sort of more intervention than she wanted, then she's going to stop calling the police mm. in that one time, right, that she doesn't yeah. call the police, maybe the time he killed her. So, you know, people are not saying we shouldn't have intervention into domestic violence. Definitely we need intervention. But the intervention should be evidence-informed. We should be asking experts. We should be surveying victims. And we should also be surveying the most marginalized women, the women of color who face sort of abuses both from, you know, maybe intimate partners and people in the neighborhood, but also from a system that has marginalized them. Well, and that, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm going to jump on it because that is such a huge point and, and relates so importantly to the conversation happening in the country right now. Uh, in Minneapolis, you know, the city council just voted uh, to defund the police department in that city where where the killing of, of George Floyd took place. So just as it seems to me and putting together some of the other things that you you've argued, just as you can look at these spectacular criminals, you know, the really uh, extreme cases, the Harvey Weinstein, the serial killer, the domestic abuser who actually murders his partner as justification for the entire system from arrest, through prosecution, through incarceration, and all the social, economic, and, and, uh, uh, and, and racial impacts of that system, to justify that system, you can also say, what, defund the police? That's going to lead to mass lawlessness. That's just going to, you know, it's the same almost false argument if you only look at it in that most superficial way. So. You're not saying that that domestic violence example that you just gave us, that that there's no basis for some kind of intervention there. Just we can come up with better ways to spend those dollars much more effectively without thinking of every violation, even at the misdemeanor level, as an occasion to put somebody behind bars. Well, that's right. I mean, so I think we've lived through a political era in, you know, the, the latter 20th century, where people were really convinced by the argument that, you know, you see blight, you see crime, um, you see, you know, neighborhoods that, that you don't want to go into. Well, that's the problem of individual criminals, right? Like, and that's something that these are bad people, you know, they're evil, we need to declare war on them. And yeah. so, you know, I think there was a very effective campaign, basically, for many, many years to see these, what we, you know, called crime problems as a problem of individual bad people's choice. And we need to send, you know, um, a, a highly armed, you know, forceful police force in there, and we need to lock these people away, and that's going to solve our problem. Like, that's how you solve your problems. It, it, it isn't poverty. It isn't inequality. It isn't racism. It's bad people that need to go to jail, right? And I, and I think that was a mindset that got really ingrained in people, but is very much changing, right? It's We're in the midst of well, that yeah. change right now. It got dressed up in the language of law and order, but anybody who's looked at Nixon, who, you know, who famously built his whole campaign in 1968 around law and order also built it around the so-called southern strategy which was to which was to stir up southern whites on on issues of race and so 
you know, President Trump is hearkening back to that when he talks about law and order or tweets law and order. I mean, that's that's really loaded and coded type language. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, He's you hoping that, that the Nixon the Nixon sixty eight strategy will work for him. Right. Yeah. That that's certainly what what you know the president's hoping. Um, you know, and will it? You know, that remains to be seen. There's a slightly different dynamic, or, or a very different dynamic, going on here, um, where we have a lot of solidarity between Democratic white voters and Black Lives Matter movement. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just young people and hippies and uh, and all that. It's a lot of people across the spectrum are saying, right, you know, that's going to be a big change. We saw that Floyd video. We saw it. We saw it with our yeah, own eyes. Everyone and, saw. You know. Right. That video may be in itself, you know, somewhat spectacular. Like it's 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 horrific, right? Um, but I think people also have the sense that no, this isn't just a bad apple. There's something systemic here, right? And when you look at, for example, I, I gave you the New York City stop and frisk, well they were making millions of of stops a year. Yeah. And upwards of eighty, ninety percent of them were black and Latino. And of course, they weren't finding anything because they were just these gratuitous stops based on this mindset that the police had to go out and show the, you know, show these young men of color who's boss. Well, yeah. that's not a bad apple doing it, right? That is a mindset. That is sort of, you know, it's becoming hackneyed now to say, you know, when, it, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But it is. Mm -hmm. It's a certain mindset in police training that every citizen, every individual that they're meant to serve and protect every individual that they come across is not only a potential criminal but a potential life threat so much so that they need to be armed and on high alert i mean that's part of what police officers are told so if you bring them in in this mindset for everything of course they're going to exercise this authority and then given you know conscious and unconscious biases that exercise of authority is going to disproportionately harm people of color. Although I will say there are also plenty of white people and white men who are killed by police who yeah. are subject to police violence, right? Like this isn't only a black and white phenomenon. Right. This is also a question of what kind of society do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a society where our preferred solution has been to police prosecute and imprison people so much so that we have 5% of the population, but a third of the world's prison population. Like, do we want that anymore? Well, right. I mean, I talked, I, no. I talked to someone last week whose brother was killed by a black police officer. And she's out there demonstrating with the same people who are upset about George Floyd having been killed by a white. So it's not so, I think people may misunderstand. It's not that police officers themselves are all racists. You know, it's 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 the racial uh, ness of the system and the and the racial impact of the system and the way the whole culture of police departments have have become racist. So, it, you know, I think that's that's another, I think, very important point. But what you know, to come back to your roots, though, I mean, you as a lifelong feminist and steeped in this and raised in this and and. Uh, and a scholar in this throughout your career are saying, if I understand, not, hey, Har the Harvey Weinsteins, the, the worst bad actors in cases of sexual assault, in cases of rape, in cases of domestic violence. We're not saying let's not have any prisons. Yeah, those people ought to be punished. And that needs to be part of a system of punishment in this country. But so, so just as when people say defund the police, we're not saying let's not have anything in our communities to help keep you know law and order, but let's just do it differently. It, it, am I understanding that right? That you're not saying let the those the, the monsters. I think the you're. Yeah, have, I think you're uh, asking whether I'm a prison abolitionist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I, and I do want to. And, and in a second, I will bring it back to sort of feminism and and. and and so what this has to do with it. But I think, you know, I think probably I would categorize myself as, you know, prison abolitionist sort of adjacent. Like, so uh, <laughs> let me put it this way. I think 
that if as feminists and if as people who are against sexual violence and people who are for equality, both women's equality and equality for people of color, if our major victory in life is the fact that Harvey Weinstein is going to spend more than 20 years in jail, that is a very shallow victory. Mm -hmm. I see prisons as they're constituted and carried out, uh, not only as entirely too overfull and large and sites of awful violence, they're also concentrated sites of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. The prison system, when you when you look at it, and right now, you know, the, the, the health crises with COVID that are yeah. ravaging prisons, uh, how they use solitary confinement, just everything that goes on within the walls of those institutions is horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people, people generally don't stay in prison forever, um, and they're released. And when they come out, um, they're not better for having spent time in a condition of degradation. Um, so, I, you know, so I don't think the prison system as it's constituted is some form of justice in society. Mm -hmm. um, but that's different than the question of whether people who harm other people should be held accountable um, or whether there are certain people that are just so dangerous out there that we, you know, have some license to incapacitate them. Those are, are different questions than whether, you know, in today's policing and prison system, we want to create more laws uh, to put more people in jail because we're feminist. That's the question I look at. And my answer is a pretty clear no, that that is not sort of a, a, a gender justice position. Um, but I will say this. I will say this. You know, everybody always says when you say, let's imagine a world without prisons. Let's imagine a world with alternate forms of accountability and alternate forms of healing and alternate forms of prevention of crime. They say, well, what about the murderer? Mm -hmm. and, you know, what about the horrible serial killer murderer? Well, the fact of the matter is that a huge chunk of murders just aren't solved. Those murderers are out there right now with the mass incarceration system we have, right? That's not solving them. And in fact, maybe if you, if you put more resources into actually solving crimes and hiring people who have, have different kinds of degrees, modeling degrees, science degrees, you know, people who are philosophers or whatever, to solve crimes instead of conceiving policing as sort of this very masculine um, display of force, you know, and, and take that money from street policing and put it to solving murders and solving serial rapes and testing the rape kits, you yeah. actually would be in a position to assess whether these people should be off the street and what their confinement should look like. But instead, we've invested in this massive authoritarian show of display on the streets where black people live. And that's how we've decided to do crime control because it's never, in my mind, been all about how to protect people from the worst murderers. And it's always been about how do we frame society's problems in a political way? How do we manage human beings' anxiety? And for politicians, how do we capitalize on the fact that human beings are afraid of crime and afraid of some people more than others. So I don't, I don't think, you know, from the beginning, if we, look at, if we look at the origins of policing and slave patrols or the origins of prisons in sort of protecting the capital interests from debtors, if we look at the origins of the criminal justice system, it really was never about just protecting people or incapacitating murderers. It was about so many other things, and I think people are starting to realize that. Well, it, there's no, I mean, we've done a number of episodes on this program about prison reform and, and questioning the, the, the entire underpinnings, the philosophical underpinnings of punishment in this country, criminal punishment, uh, from s sex crimes perpetrators to, uh, uh, you know, the, the concept of rehabilitation, the, the problem of no education and training that, that takes place in prisons, prison work, you know, for 10 cents an hour. I mean, there's a lot to think about and, and, and focus on in terms of reforming that, but it, it, it does seem 
um, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but a clash in the sense of the major trend lines that bring us to today where it seems, and, and I want to get to the point of asking you, what, what do fellow feminists you encounter think about the position you're taking on this? Because it does seem like finally we have a, a, a greater consciousness of the ways the law has uh, been so inequitable to women, to victims of gendered crimes. Um, uh, and, and here we come to a point where a Harvey Weinstein, but not just Harvey Weinstein, others too, uh, can actually be convicted. Bill Cosby was convicted here in Pennsylvania uh, not that long ago, where there are criminal and civil actions in court uh, uh, regarding sexual harassment and sexual assault in the workplace in a way that was unthinkable 20 years ago, um, where, where despite many thousands of rape kits not being tested, and, and I know the stories you're talking about there, um, attitudes about victims who make allegations of, of rape or sexual assault has been a real shift, whether on college campuses, despite Betsy DeVos trying to move the pendulum back the other way. I mean, there has been these major shifts in the last, I don't know, what, five, five, ten years. What, what do we do with these people who do need to be held accountable then, bearing in mind that prisons are horribly overcrowded. There's a racial element to that. All the points. And, and let me add, about, let me add, there's is, a huge. Yeah. No, Sorry, I was just going to add that there's a huge and historical racial element to the domestic violence and rape crimes. In fact, right in the late 19th century and early 20th century, they were known as Negro crimes. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why, um, you know, these these gender crimes were considered worse than even murder or like aggravated assault is that they could they could, you know, mix up these crimes against women with with blackness, frankly. And yeah. so, you know, these have well, never that's the been... connection to lynching too. the history of lynching in our country on so many occasions was well, based. Yeah, and that's that's right. one of the reasons why people got really freaked out over that. Um, Amy Cooper, Christian Cooper birding, you know, dog leash video mm -hmm. was this idea that there had been this history of white women, you know, falsely accusing black men and inciting the lynch mob. But right. all those false accusations have happened in the context of sexual violence because mm -hmm. sexuality, deviant sexuality and blackness was always connected up and still continues to be something that people connect up unconsciously and consciously. So I just don't think it's as simple as that, you know, for, for feminists to say, oh, we've come so far because um, people are going to be willing to put men in jail for sexual violence. That's like this amazing sign of progress. Um, I, you know, I think that's the narrative, but the reality, as I try to show in my book, is a little bit different. So like the, narr the feminist narrative, and one that, I, again, I believe, was that throughout history, rape and domestic violence have always been underpunished, right? Uh, right? Women have never been believed, and men have had a virtual license to beat women and to, um, uh, to rape women. And so when in today's world we see men going to jail for deviant rape, well, naturally that's progress, right? The past was sexist. The pa past mm -hmm. had criminal under enforcement. So criminal enforcement is the feminist move. So mm -hmm. that, that, you hear that all the time. That is the way people have, you know, come up thinking about feminism, which is why I think it's so important that I, I dug back into the history of, well, is this true? And it turned out it's not true. Actually, women and feminists had a lot of agency in affecting criminal laws at the turn of the century. And these criminal laws were very punitive against rape and very punitive mm. against DV. And the brunt of them was felt very much not only by black men, but also by women. Vice, prostitution, underage sex, those regulations led to a flood of girls reformatories in the 1920s, wow. right? Putting women in jail um, for having underage sex. 
and they were highly regulatory and authoritarian, and they were also often championed by the feminists of the day. So that's one thing to bear in mind. And another thing that I think, you know, reflects the lack of understanding that history is not linear and neat, but was a combination of patriarchy, of racial sentiments, of moralistic Christian sentiments, and very complicated, was that in today's world, you hear a lot of the younger feminists saying, we want to reclaim the word rape. We don't want to call it sexual assault. When, you know, a college student has sex with another drunken college student, we want to call that rape because that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Well, the origins of rape um, and why it was a capital offense for so long after other felonies ceased to be a capital offense wasn't in the idea, wasn't based in the idea of women's empowerment. It was based in the idea that if women are raped, they're ruined, right? Because their value as a human being is premised on their chastity and their marriage ability. Right, so the reason why rape law was so harsh actually reflected women's subordinate, not superior status. And the fact that you know people don't know that loaded history when they want to say, oh, like rape, you know, you know, rape is a fate worse than death. That's that's not necessarily rooted in the most feminist sentiment. So I just think that all this history is is very relevant. Oh, oh, here's another piece of history that's really relevant. When you look at domestic violence enforcement, really it ramped up in the late 60s. I mean, there was some domestic violence enforcement. In fact, there was a a moment in time in the turn of the century where it was sort of in vogue to whip batterers at the post because they were thought of as the most unmanly of men. And then, of course, the racists in the South loved that because they could use it as yet another excuse to whip black men at the post, right? Mm -hmm. So it's... So again, this isn't an this isn't a linear under enforcement story, but in the nineteen the late nineteen sixty well actually it was more like the early nineteen to late nineteen uh, seventies, you know you had feminists and they were coming out of that Vietnam War era left protest mindset, and they were very against the police. They were very anti authoritarian. They wanted shelter. They wanted money. A lot of them were welfare rights activists. They wanted money for women of color. And there were a lot of social scientists weighing in on domestic violence. And they also didn't really think policing was very promising. They said, you know, we need to reduce social stressors like economic anxiety, uh, racial discrimination. We need to also address family stressors through therapy. And so they were, you know, really into these alternative forms of dealing with domestic violence. And I, and I tell the story of how it happened, but even though pretty much everybody was on board with the non-carceral program, by the mid-80s, due to a variety of things that happened that I explain in my book, um, by then, law enforcement had become the preferred model. And it was really pushed through by sort of a coalition of feminists, victims' rights groups, and conservative politicians. Yeah. And, and you know, that, well, that wasn't... <laughs> right. That's a complicated story. That's not an yeah. unconditional, you know, gender justice story. And yet, you know, this happened in a fairly recent history. And yet I think when people talk about, like, how feminist progress is being really tough on DV, you know, they, they don't necessarily know this history. Hmm. Well, and then there's going to be the, then there's the big debate that we're going to have to have, which is if you're going to argue that, uh, that that we shouldn't have police departments, at least in the way that, that they've existed, then you have to figure out what you're going to have instead. I mean, there's the example you gave about stop and frisk, but also right across the river from where I am in Philadelphia is Camden, New Jersey. And, you know, Camden is being talked about now as a city that had a, a very horrible crime rate, and a terrible reputation. And uh, they essentially got rid of their police department. And guess what? The cr- crime has gone down in Canada. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, or maybe not incredible. And if you're going to get rid of prisons or, or really fundamentally change what that means, then what is that going to look like? And we're going to have to have, uh, we're going to have to still be concerned with accountability, but maybe accountability looks very different. Um but I think what people are going to need to do, I is have to get your book and read it because it's this is this is these are some of the most important issues we're we, we're facing today. <laughs>
And uh, I, I really, I, I think the perspective you bring to this is uh, is is so important. And I, I'm, I've learned a lot, and been thinking about it a lot, and really have enjoyed talking to you about it as well. So we will put a link in the description for this episode. And I know we we barely scratched the surface with this uh, topic, and we've been at it almost an hour. Um, but that's good because people will get the book and they're going to learn a whole lot more that way. The book is called The Feminist War on Crime. It's by the University of California uh, Press. That's the publisher. And Aya Gruber is the author and has been our guest on Good Law, Bad Law today. Aya, thank you again so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me.